Okay guys, so today we're going to do something a little different. I have in front of me here a tier list and I'm gonna make a tier list of all the different star types. You can see them here below. So before I start on that, the definition of star I'll be taking a bit loosely here. Like ground wars aren't exactly stars, but I'll just include them here because um, yeah so let's get started and where do we start we start with the protostar the protostar is of course the the first phase a star enters in its life it's like this is where it all begins so it's definitely one of the higher tiers because there is so many possibilities for the for the protostar it can go anyway and for that i think we have to give it at least an A tier. Like not an S tier, because it's not that powerful, but it has so many possibilities. So next up is, of course, the Brown Dwarf. And I think that it's pretty clear that that goes all the way into F tier, because who, who named that? It sounds like a fart. Brown Dwarf, come on. They, do, they can't even have life on them, because they're too, co too cold. They don't even have fusion. They are not. They are not even real stars. So let's just drop them all the way into F tier for that. Next up, we have the red dwarfs, which are like the bare minimum to be a star. Like you don't even really need to try hard. You just bam, red dwarf. Eighty percent of the stars are red dwarfs. This is like the beta male of the stars. So because it's so common, though. I'm not gonna put it in F tier, but it is definitely one of the lower tiers. The thing about red dwarfs though is that they can have really compact planetary systems. So they are good candidates for exoplanets, which ranks them a little bit up. So I'm gonna drop them in the D tier, because they're not that special, but they do have something going for them. And above those we have the orange dwarf star. Now the orange dwarf star is like actually a star. It's not as powerful as the sun, but it's it's up there. So I'ma give it a C tier. Then we have the yellow dwarf star, which which is a, a sun-like star. And well, of course the sun, it's epic. We owe our lives to it, basically. It makes all life on Earth possible. But yeah, I think this the sun-like G type star, the yellow dwarf is, is an A tier. Then we have the F type star, which is slightly more powerful than that. I would say it's a bit lower because it is just a bit too hot to be. I believe there are some exoplanet candidates which may or may not have high Earth similarity indexes around them, but it's not but it's not many, so I'm gonna move them in the C tier, and I'm actually move the orange dwarf up to the B tier. Then we have the the A type star. This is like Sirius, the the brightest star in the night sky. This is like the the show off guy. Um, I'm also give this a C tier because it is very bright and it's like it's like the the, the chat of stars, but it doesn't really offer much in the in the way of planetary systems and life. So I'm gonna give it a C tier. All right, so next up we have the, the B-type star. Now the B-type star is again, more powerful than the than the A-type star. But when it, it is still a main sequence star, but it is, it's getting too powerful for its own good, right? So it can't really have Earth-like planets because it's so hot and so much radiation. So I'm gonna put these just below the red dwarf. And then above the B-type, of course, you have the, the O-type stars. We climb the spectral class. These are all still main sequence stars, of course. But this is just an even worse version of the B star. So I would put them in E tier, but they admit the most blue light, which I think looks kind of cool. So I'm gonna give them, I'm gonna give them a C tier between the 
FNA star. Now, above these, we have the Wolf Rayet star, which is this is this is just the Giga Chat star. He's he's too chat for his own good. Like he burns himself out in like 80 million years and then implodes into a black hole. Like bam, lives in a flash and dies with style. So eh, I, I I would give this an A tier. The Wolf Rayet star. He, he doesn't live too long, but while he lives, he is he's unmatched in his prime. So I'm gonna put them just below the Proto star. So that's all the, the main sequence star. Now we're gonna list the stars that are post main sequence. So let's begin with Blue Dwarf, which is this one. A Blue Dwarf is when a Red Dwarf burns out after billions and billions of years of fusion. And then it, is, it isn't powerful enough to become a Red Giant, which we'll get to later, but something still happens so this is a hypothetical star because there hasn't been enough time yet for these to form so we don't even know if it exists so very illustrious and again it's blue and i'm kind of a simp for blue stars to be honest so i will give this a, the blue dwarf it gets a beat here so after a blue dwarf what happens to the to the star then it becomes a white dwarf these are these are these these are famous this is where most post -main, post main sequence stars will end up. Um, the white dwarf. What, where do we put this? I don't really know what, what to do with a white dwarf. It's just it's just kind of there, D tier. Now, after trillions and trillions and trillions of years, the white dwarf cools and becomes a black dwarf, which is another hypothetical star. I think this is very cool. This is basically a star which doesn't fuse anymore. It's at the end of its life, and it's and it has cooled, so that's like basically five degrees Kelvin. I'm gonna give this an S tier. So that's all. So that's all the dwarfs. But what about the red giant? Which is what a lot of main sequence stars. There aren't red dwarfs. They will like in the final phase of their life, they will bulge up and, and become a red giant. Our sun will do this too in like nine billion years. Uh, they are very epic, so one of the higher tiers, but not the highest, because they kind of tend to destroy their planetary systems while they do it. I'm going to give it a high B tier. So, then we have the Carbon Star, which is basically the same as a red giant, except it's actually red due to the fact that it has a lot more carbon in it. Uh, it has to be higher than, than the red giant because it's still basically the same, but because it's actually reddish, it gets just higher in the B tier. Then we have the super giant, which is like a red giant, but it's become even, even bigger. Uh, only more massive stars like the A, B and o, o stars. Only those do that. So... I'm gonna give the super giant. It's not the biggest of the giants, so I will give it a C tier. Just it's just good enough. Then of course we get to the hyper giants, which actually are very impressive. These almost always turn into black holes at the end. Like um, they die in powerful hypernovas, like uh, Eta Carina is one. Which is 8,000 light years away and can still threaten the Earth, even even despite that distance. So it has to be S tier. This is like the boss of the of the hypergiants. Now, after the hypergiants and all the giants have burned out, we get beyond the main sequence. Like supernova happens, and then any of these can form. So first off, except of course the white dwarf, which we already did, we have the neutron star. Neutron stars, very epic. They have completely imploded and their individual atoms have been shattered into neutrons, allowing them to be extremely dense and often do extremely cool tricks, which we'll get to in a bit. But for now, I will give the neutron star a solid S tier. I did a whole video on neutron stars just because they can do so many epic cool, cool things. Uh, one of these things is, of course, the pulsar, which is when a neutron star reserves the rotational momentum 
of the red giant, allowing it to start spinning really fast. Some pulsars rotate their own axis over 600 times per second. I think the pulsar is just as much an S tier as the normal neutron star. Even higher though, because we can actually build clocks based on these. They, they are called pulsar clocks. And these timings are so precise that, yeah, S tier. Another cool thing that neutron stars can do is reserve, which incre is increase their magnetic field like many, many times. So a magnetar is a neutron star that does the same as a pulsar basically, but it gets a really strong magnetic field. Magnetars can be so strong in magnetic field that if the sun were one, it would even at its distance be able to clear the information on your credit cards simply with its magnetism. So for that sheer power, I'm almost inclined to give it a same as in as the S tier, other neutron star. Yeah, neutron stars are epic, they're all S tiers. But it's just, just below the neutron star, because it doesn't do the... Yeah. Now, what happens if the star is even more massive? What happens if it's even more massive, the neutrons get smashed in the implosion that is the supernova, and they get broken up into individual quarks, and they form a quark star, which is a really exotic one. We haven't actually confirmed any to be found, like might exist and we have a few candidates but we don't know for sure yet so very mysterious very powerful very dense i would i i like these kind of stars so i'm putting these the quark star yeah it's it's upper s tier here yeah theoretically quarks can be broken down into prions which would suggest that there are prion stars. However, most scientists nowadays agrees that prions might not actually exist. So while it would be very cool, this is kind of like kind of like a Bigfoot star. Like it would be cool if it existed, but it probably doesn't. So if it exists, it's definitely one of the high tiers, but since it probably doesn't, I'm going to move it down into the, the D tier. Then we get to the dark star, which sounds very cool, but it's actually just a normal star, but it's made out of dark matter. So, yeah, what do we do with a dark matter star? It's just like a normal star, it's just there, but it is made of dark matter, which is, which would be very cool, so... I'll give this a low B tier, the Dark Matter star. Now, of course, if the star is even heavier and even the Prion star is surpassed, it becomes, becomes the crown jewel of astronomy, the black hole. Now, black holes, very powerful, do very interesting physics, are extremely cool, or like everyone agrees on them, but for that, they're also a little bit normy. So I will give, they're not as cool as like neutron stars because they do have all their own interesting features. But to me, they're not, they're not S tier. Like they're high A tier, like maybe on par with the protostar because it's like, ooh, elusive. It's elu yeah, elusive describes them good. Now that's all the regular stars, quote unquote. Now we go into the more variable type. So let's start, so let's start with the Cepheid variable star, which is basically like a giant star, but it varies in temperature and diameter. So to me, that's just a bit confusing. Like, huh, why would you do that? That's weird. So. I'm giving this a high, no, I'm not putting it in E tier. The Cephiots aren't, yeah. I can't imagine that would be a great candidate for having a planetary system. Then we have the Vampire Star, 
which sounds very epic. And it's like, it's a binary star where one of the stars has a greater gravitational pull and is sucking in the other star's matter. These stars are very dangerous because typically they come in the form of a white dwarf and a red giant. And if the white dwarf builds up enough matter, it will go nova and basically destroy the whole neighborhood. I'm going to give these a low 8 here as well. Then we have the T Tauri stars, which are a type of protostar, which is very young, but also still varies a lot in brightness, which is, well, in my opinion, that, that's kind of like, when you're young, you want to explore the different directions, and that's kind of like what the T Tauri star is doing. It's like just poking around, not sure where to go. It, it has a lot of chances, but it also, yeah, C tier. Next up, we have the Algol variable, which to me personally is a very cool concept. Like, this is another binary star where one of the stars passes in front of the other. And if you observe that from far away, the star periodically changes in brightness because one star in front of the other, then the other, and it eclipses like that. We have one, these are named after, of course, Algol which I think is also a very cool star system. And I'm inclined to give these like middle A tier. Then we have regular binary systems, like just two stars. Most of the stars in the universe are binary in fact. So they get a bit of a normie, a normie nerf. I'm gonna give them, I'm putting them in, in D tier. Now, maybe the high D tier, cause they are kind of complex in that. They try to be different. So like. I'm gonna give them a high C tier actually. But it gets even more complex when you have multiple stars, like three or more. We even have found as much as eight stars in one system. Like that's just chaos. But it is also very impressive that that scientifically works. Like if you were doing this in a world build, it would be very tricky and people would like, huh, you have eight stars in your system? How does that work? But it does exist in nature, and I think that's that's commendable. Like, I'm giving them a low S tier, more than three stars in your system. Then we have the Flare Star, which is, it is a red dwarf, but periodically it releases massive solar flares. So it can rapidly change in brightness, it bombards its planets with radiation, which that's just, just a sigma move in my opinion. So I will give them floor stars a low B tier. And then we are left with the quasi star. Quasi stars don't exist anymore. Uh, Times Infinity has a really cool video explaining them. Go check that out. They're basically in the early universe when everything was a lot more dense. Star would, stars would become way bigger than they are now, like tens of times bigger. And at their core, they would be able to sustain a black hole, which would then slowly consume the star. So basically, it's a star that's very big, very big, but it's also slowly committing suicide. So for that, they get, of course, they, they nerf themselves into the C tier. But they are like the biggest stars that could have ever existed. So I'll put these in the low middle upper B tier, actually, above the carbon star. And there we have it, our stars tier list. I, uh, I hope you enjoyed that video. I was trying something a little different from what I normally do. And uh, yeah, I will leave a... I will leave a link to the template in the description below so you can make your own tier lists. Go and send them to me in the comments below. I'd love to hear your opinions and yeet ye out.